Hey everyone, Victor is here, your guide to all things organic chemistry, and today I want to talk about the hydroboration of alkynes, which is like a dragonfly of organic reactions. It's precise, it's efficient, and it's one of the coolest reactions of alkynes, just like the dragonfly is one of the coolest insects. So grab your cup of coffee, a notebook to work through the mechanisms and examples with me, hit that like button for good luck on the test, and let's get started! Hydroboration of alkynes starts with, well, an alkyne, a 3 methyl but one ion to be precise for this particular example. In the first step of this reaction, we are going to perform an electrophilic attack from the borane on the pi bond. This is the same style of the electrophilic attack that we saw in the hydroboration of alkenes. At the same time, one of our hydrogens is going to jump on the carbon, and this gives us a product looking like this. Since this is a syn addition, both hydrogen and boron will end up on the same side of the newly formed double bond, cis to each other. Also, like in the case with alkenes, one equivalent of our borane may potentially react with multiple alkynes, but with alkynes it's less likely. And for the simplicity's sake, we'll pretend that it only happens once regardless. Now, before we move on, I want to make sure you have a very firm understanding of what's going on with the first step of this mechanism. When we say that the pi electrons go onto the boron like this, we are making a new carbon-boron bond. And likewise, when we are showing the curved arrow from the Hb bond to a carbon, this means we are taking the hydrogen with all its electrons and moving it onto the carbon atom. And since carbons are now sp2 hybridized, we also change the geometry of the molecule to reflect that. Alright, back to my mechanism. So the next step is going to be the oxidation with the hydrogen peroxide. Similar to what we saw in this reaction for the alkenes, the hydrogen peroxide will first get deprotonated by the hydroxide ion, giving me a peroxide anion and water, and it's this peroxide anion that will be actually attacking my boron, giving us the intermediate that looks like this. Next, we'll do the oxidative migration step, where the carbon slides over to the oxygen atom releasing the OH, and finally we'll knock the boron out of our molecule, giving the corresponding enolate ion. Now, this enolate is stabilized by the resonance. And of course, the major resonance contributor here is going to be the one with the negative charge on the oxygen rather than the one with the negative charge on the carbon. However, we need to keep in mind that the resonance structures are representations of the same, exactly the same molecule of the same species. This means that when we are going to protonate our molecule to make it neutral, we can add a proton to the carbon atom or to the oxygen atom. Former gives us the aldehyde product, while the latter gives us the enol product. And this part of the mechanism is nothing but the base promoted keto enol totemerism in disguise, simply because the proton transfer steps here, they are, well, reversible. And since we know that the carbonyl form is more prevalent in the keto enol totemerism equilibrium, the aldehyde here is going to be the major product. So technically, you can bypass the formation of the enol altogether, however, if it makes it easier for you to visualize what's happening in this reaction using the enol midpoint, then you can certainly draw that as an intermediate. This also can be useful if you are using the shortcut to predict the product for this reaction. So let's look at this cyclohexylethine. If we are doing the hydroboration of this compound, I will first redraw my molecule, but now with a double bond instead of a triple bond. Also notice that I am drawing it at a 120 degree angle right away, because I know that the carbon will no longer be sp3 hybridized, so it's no longer going to have linear geometry. Then I'll add the OH group to the less substituted carbon of my bond, and that gives me my enol intermediate. And finally, using the trick that I told you about in the hydration of alkynes video, we are going to make our final product by erasing this double bond and making this carbonyl over here, which gives me the aldehyde as my final product. And since my OH group and consequently the oxygen of the carbonyl end up on the less substituted atom, this type of product is often referred to as an anti-Markovnikov product. 
or in other words, we get our OH or O on the less substituted carbon, while the hydrogen is on the more substituted carbon. Remember that even though my hydrogen is not shown here, it is an implicit hydrogen, it is still there. All right, here is another example. I'm going to do the same trick here as well. First, I'll redraw this molecule, but now with a double bond instead of a triple bond, and I will zigzag it right away. I will add the OH group to the less substituted atom, this gives me my enol form, and then I will convert that into the corresponding aldehyde. Easy peasy. Now, how are we going to deal with the molecule with an internal alkyne? Something like this, for instance. Well, in this case, the problem is that both my atoms are secondary, so we don't have a more substituted or a less substituted atom. So what am I going to do here? And if I were to do a regular hydroboration oxidation in this case, I'll end up with a mixture of two possible products. So is that what I'm going to have? I'm just going to have a mixture and there is nothing I can do here? Well, not all is lost in this case. Instead of a regular borane, we can use a modified reagent. Among the most common bulky boranes, we can see the disimyl borane, 9 bora 331 nonane or 9-BBN for short, or we can also see the dicyclohexyl borane. These reagents are extremely sensitive towards the steric hindrances and will orient themselves in such a way as to put the boron with the bulky groups as far from the bulkier groups of the substrate as possible. This results in the final product with the oxygen on the atom that is further away from the bulkier group in our molecule, just like what we wanted originally. So if instead of a regular borane in my example above, I use say 9-BBN, I will end up with my right molecule as my major product because now my oxygen is further away from the bulky group in my substrate. And this is because in the first step of my reaction, the borane will turn away from the cyclopentyl ring, forcing the intermediate that will have those groups further apart from each other, giving me the product with the OH group further away from the cyclopentyl ring, resulting in the final product, which is going to have the oxygen atom correspondingly further away from the cyclopentyl ring as well. So remember, if you need additional regioselectivity in your hydroboration reaction, use one of the bulky boranes, either disiamyl or 9-BBN or dicyclohexyl borane. And you can also use the same trick in the hydroboration of alkenes reaction to make sure that your alcohol always ends up on the less substituted atom. And I bet the first time you saw a mechanism like this, it seemed really intimidating. Well, how about now? Especially when you know an easy trick to predict the final product. Is it still a subject of nightmares? Or you feel like you can do it? Tell me what you think in the comments below. Also, thank you for watching this video. I want to especially thank all Organic Chemistry Tutor members and my donors for support and encouragement. You guys are awesome! If you want to become a member or support me making these videos every single day, all links are in the description below. Leave your questions and feedback in the comments below, hit that like button if you learned something new today, watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow!